great pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Emma uh, Talentire for the next talk. I actually had the pleasure of introducing Emma at last year's uh, Ectrams debate, but wasn't able to meet her in person until today, so that was a real pleasure. Um, Dr. Talentire um, is a uh, clinical senior lecturer in neurology at the Cardiff University School of Medicine and has been involved in caring for people with MS since 2006. Her research interests um, include combining real-world clinical data with biological and imaging data to strengthen predictions of outcomes and to improve uh, trial design. She's also involved in a number of national and international clinical trials that investigate the optimum treatment approaches in people with MS. And today, Emma will be talking to us about disease-modifying therapy management and raises the somewhat provocative question of whether disease biology and treatment algorithms meet or not. Emma. Thank you. Thanks very much, Siwon. So it's a real pleasure to be here. And again, I'd echo other speakers' um, comments on really commending the organisers. It's been such a challenging time. And David, in particular, I thought did an amazing job in pulling the meeting together um, despite the circumstances. So thanks very much for the invite to speak. Um, and I have a few disclosures um, in terms of commercial um, conflicts or interests. But I also just wanted to make the point that I'm a clinician, for those in the audience who don't know me. Um, before <clears throat> being a scientist. So I think that there are other people in the audience who may be much better placed to discuss the um, disease biology, but I'm really um, glad to be invited to address this title. It was a really challenging talk to put together, um, but what I want to try to do is just to hopefully revise for many of you disease biology, but perhaps frame things in a different way, looking at the different phases of disease, how we're using disease-modifying therapies, and as G1 mentioned, where these meet or differ. So um, in terms of what we know, well, I think when we learn about MS um, during our career, we tend to start out with quite a fundamental um, approach, thinking of these hallmark features of white matter focal inflammatory demyelination, don't we? And then as we learn more and more about MS, we kind of appreciate more and more complexity in the disease biology that I just wanted to go over in some detail today. But I also really wanted to make the point that we need to think about the biology at the different phases of MS. So you know, it's a lifelong illness. And I think that it's really important when we think about DMTs to look at the person in front of us and think what phase of the illness are they in and which sort of biology is really um, prominent at that stage. So again, you know, the hallmark feature of MS that we all learn about first is this focal inflammatory demyelination of the white matter. But I just want to spend a few slides reminding you or perhaps introducing you to the fact that, of course, inflammation is so much more than that in MS. So in terms of the focal white matter lesions, yes, you know, we do see these perivascular inflammatory infiltrates that are sort of lymphocytic. Um, and then we've heard about the um, fact that the microglia um, you know, and macrophage lineage is very important. And of course, this um, definition of an active demyelinating lesion is these um, macrophage lineage cells that contain myelin debris. They're obviously there um, you know, with the breakdown products of myelin. Um, these dense um, lymphocytic and microglial infiltrates that we see in the um, active lesions. But I think there's also been a, a surge of sort of reinterest in these, um, what used to be called chronically active lesions, now mixed active and inactive, where they have this active edge. Um, because partly because there have been some innovations in demonstrating those on MRI that we're going to hear about later in the meeting. Um, and also just because of this association with this slow expansion of lesions and the idea that actually these lesions may evolve over many, many years rather than running a course and recovering and becoming inactive quite quickly. Um, so the other thing is that, you know, coming back to this idea of the biology of MS changing over time is that this really nice work, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that show that when you look at the duration of disease, so this is a um, um, study of histology in people's brains from um, post-mortem and biopsy, depending on how long they'd had disease before the tissue was sampled. And you can see that those um, active lesions that we talked about here um, you know, are very prominent in the early stages of disease, but less um, prominent later on. Whereas this sort of mixed active inactive or smoldering lesions remain present later on. And actually, um, there was some um, nice work that was done um, at post-mortem that showed that 78% uh, of people, sorry, um, with MS um, who got to post-mortem, as you can imagine, many of which who'd um, by that time had progressive MS and advanced disability, um, still had these mixed active inactive lesions present. So there was still some degree of inflammation in the white matter focal lesions. And interestingly, the presence of those did seem to predict how severe the MS had been 
um, in terms of progression. The other thing that I think many of you probably appreciate is that although um, we think of MS as being a white matter disease, of course, there's um, prominent involvement of the gray matter. And it was really the use of immunohistochemistry for myelin proteins that allowed um, uh, pathologists to be able to appreciate really the extent. And there are some interesting findings, um, particularly this subpeel type of lesion, which is very, very prominent and can um, go across several um, gyri. Um, the fact that um, it's not a very um, clear image, but what you can appreciate um, is that the location of the lesions are often quite deep inside the sulci, um, and um, that seems to suggest that there may be something that's coming from the CSF or the meninges in um, and is being trapped in some of these deeper sulci. Um, and that's really um, also supported um, by work on meningeal inflammation um, and Many of you will be familiar now with these um, appearances of inflammation that's sitting in little pockets or follicles, um, um, which are in the meninges. And the fact that um, they also seem to co-locate not only deep in the sulci, but also adjacent to cortical lesions. And people who have um, follicles, as is shown here, um, seem to be more likely to have grey matter lesions more of the grey matter lesions than those who don't have follicles. So almost certainly some sort of interaction between these meningeal um, uh, clusters of inflammation and the adjacent um, subpeal demyelination. But the inflammation in MS, again, is more complex because it's not just in these focal areas of white matter and grey matter demyelination. It's also throughout the parenchyma. So if you take people with MS versus age match controls, there will be more diffuse inflammation. Um, and... Uh, that's largely micro, uh, microglial, um, and it's not really clear how that happens or the order of play, but certainly there have been associations on histology with the uh, microglia being adjacent to oligodendrocytes that appear stressed, next to axons that are degenerating, next to other sorts of inflammation, and also this paranodal um, disruption. Um, and some of the microglial inf inflammation in the um, sort of normal appearing, if you like, tissue seems to spontaneously resolve, but others seem to precede uh, a lesion appearing, a focal white matter um, demyelinating lesion appearing. And that may explain why lesions are more likely to appear in the um, uh, sort of connected area to where an existing lesion is, because there may be some axonal degeneration associated with this microglial inflammation. Uh, and then uh, arising another lesion. Um, and although um, parenchymal inflammation is present really at all stages of MS in terms of that um, over the course of someone's life, it seems that there may be signals towards um, microglia having a more activated phenotype later on in progressive MS and being associated with um, greater diffuse axonal injury. So, Again, we know that one of the hallmark features of MS is disruption of the blood-brain barrier that's seen around about the um, site of these focal lesions as they arise. Um, many of us also who are clinicians will be familiar with the fact that the more advanced someone's MS is, they seem to have um, somewhat fewer gadolinium-enhancing lesions, but certainly they still are present. But I think what's been of much interest recently is the fact that, um, whereas here you can see dysferlin, which is a marker of um, endothelial disruption in the blood-brain barrier, and you can also see um, in the tissues this fibrin, uh, which is a um, protein that should remain in the, in the vessel, leaking out in someone with um, active lesion in early MS. You can see somebody here um, with primary progressive MS um, where all the fibrin is still within the um, lumen of the blood vessel, and there isn't that dysferlin um, signal to suggest blood-brain breakdown blood-brain barrier breakdown. So there's this suggestion that actually what's happened is that you may have a relatively intact blood-brain barrier um, later on in more progressive phenotypes of MS. And actually, um, the worrying thing is that the inflammation may be going on behind this relatively intact barrier, which of course makes it much difficult, more difficult to target with therapeutics. So I think just a reminder that inflammation in MS is very complex compared to the introductory kind of modules we get when we learn about MS. And also just a reminder that some of the inflammation that happens early maybe decreases over time, whereas there are some features of the inflammatory response that seem to increase as the disease goes on. So what about the disease biology of neurodegeneration? Um, 
Well, there's certainly evidence of that that's been nicely illustrated in terms of axonal swellings um, that are evident of the axon um, degenerating, and also the fact that um, these co-localize with um, particularly microglial cells, as is shown here in these dual-stained um, sections with neurons associating um, damaged neurons associating with the microglia, um, and it's. Certainly, there's compelling evidence that this is an immune-driven process because this damage to axons and neurons is much more um, prevalent in these very active lesions where there's lots of inflammation, and it's much less evident but not completely absent in inactive lesions and normal appearing white matter. So certainly, it seems like the early immune changes um, drive neurodegeneration in MS, but you'll also be quite familiar with the fact that this is um, change um, reaching EGSS milestones from the onset of disease, but this is reaching EGSS 6 once you've already um, established EGSS 4, so it's moving from EGSS 4 to 6. And as I'm sure many of you are familiar, that seems to be much more agnostic of what's happened in your earlier disease in terms of relapse rates and so on. So the idea that once you reach EGSS 4, there might be this relentless progression, sort of irrespective of what's happened before, and this has led people to make different conclusions about how immune-driven the neurodegeneration is in MS, to the extent that there are some who really believe that the first problem is a cellular degeneration problem, either of neurons, oligodendrocytes, and so on, and then actually the autoimmune um, demyelination and so on comes later. Um, that would be the sort of most extreme, but I think there are many people who... Um, feel that actually the inflammatory damage in the tissue is the primer, um, but then what follows is almost a cascade of um, uh, neurodegeneration or, or threat to the neuron and the axon that is then um, sort of amplified and difficult to stop even if you completely switch off inflammation at that time. So I think, you know, whether you think of it as being a completely independent process that comes first is probably more controversial, but I think there's a lot of evidence to say that once that process is well underway, it is no longer enough to switch off inflammation to stop that neurodegeneration. I think that's why the treatment of progressive MS is proving to be very challenging. So I just wanted to give a clinic example of that, um, where this is a gentleman who's given permission for his um, story and his images to be used. So this is a gentleman who had a single attack um, which affected his left leg and was relatively prompt, promptly started on disease-modifying therapy. And he had serial imaging, um, which was... Um, so he didn't have a very high lesion load, actually. This is his brain um, at onset. And then he didn't have a very high lesion load. And there was certainly no change at all in terms of his brain lesion load over time. And I'm talking, as with most clinical imaging, about these T2 um, uh, hyperintense lesions in the, in the brain that we're looking at. Um, and yet, I would write to him each year and tell him that it's reassuring that your imaging hasn't changed and your sort of disease-modifying therapy appears to be working and so on. But he would um, you know, point out that actually from a certain point, his EGSS, which you can see here, uh, was increasing. And that was mainly, almost all, driven by his left leg gradually deteriorating in terms of weakness, in terms of stiffness and so on. And actually, when I met with him most recently in clinic and we looked back at his imaging, you know, he does have, it doesn't project terribly well, but he does have quite a striking um, lesion that was present in the left side of his upper spinal cord um, and lower medulla. And, you know, when people, and I have more than one example of people recently that I've seen in this situation where I feel like the best way to explain that to them is that, you know, most of the um, sort of insult came on quite quickly, and that's when he experienced his symptoms back in 2016. But probably this um, retrograde and antigrade degeneration of, of axons um, that um, is then occurring from that initial insult, um, even though I feel like we've probably switched inflammation off relatively well, um, is probably propagating over months and years in, in a way that was very difficult for us to intervene. So this is something that you will have be familiar with and um, has gained, it's an old concept, but it's gained a new name and lots of interest recently, um, progression independent of relapses. So I just wanted to walk you briefly through this because I think it's relevant to the question of disease biology and DMT. So um, it, it was first described by Ludwig Kapos, but this is um, a, a sort of slightly amended version of um, a, a recent brain paper looking at this in a really nice way. And this is using a cohort, I think it's called the Novartis Oxford cohort, which is 20 different trials that Novartis have done, including their long-term extensions. So it's about 27,000 patients. So it's a huge number of people, and they've kind of adjusted it into clinical trials and um, extensions and so on. 
But essentially what you're looking at here is a cohort of people um, who were on a trial. The, these in red relapsed, these in blue did not relapse. Um, and then in the grey here, these are the people that had a confirmed disability worsening, and we're sort of familiar with that language from clinical trials now. So you can see this proportion had worsening here, the grey is bigger, uh, and here these were trials of people with progressive MS. And what you can see in the insert is that the red is the proportion of people with clinical disability worsening who it was thought to have been mainly driven by relapses. So that was called relapse-associated worsening. The blue is the number of people in this grey box who were thought that their disability was driven by progression independent of relapses. And for reasons that are slightly complicated, some of the people who had clinical disability worsening could not be categorised as either, um, particularly in relapsing MS. But I think this has shown an interesting finding, which is that progress, uh, progression independent of relapses does occur early. And the, interestingly, the definition they used here compared to in Ludwig Kapos's um, description a couple of years earlier was much more stringent, and they did that for a reason. So this is probably an underestimation. And if you measured things in more detailed ways than this EDSS-driven definition, you might find even more PIRA. But I think the point is that if you look hard enough, progression is occurring even in the early stages of disease. Interestingly, in this cohort, there did not seem to be much of a treatment effect on PIRA. So in fact, PIRA was relatively more contributing. So although the number of cl clinical disability worsenings was less in the treatment arms, um, the amount of PIRA was not really significantly different. Um, so there's a question over whether PIRA is something that our modern DMTs are um, really improving or not. And I think the other thing um, is that in the very small group of people who had pediatric MS that were described in this paper, um, PIRA seems to be even less obvious. So again, there's this question of does your age and the, the phase of your MS influence um, you know, the different um, biology and the clinical manifestations of that. So moving on to regeneration and repair. Um, before we go into some DMT algorithms. So I think you know, there, there is evidence of, demyelin, uh, of remyelination in people with MS, and it's shown here as a shadow plaque. So this is early remyelination, and these things called shadow plaques because they're not quite as um, uh, uh, sort of... Uh, they're not quite as bald in terms of myelin as these demyelinated lesions, but neither are they quite as rich in myelin as the adjacent normal appearing white matter. Um, so these have been well recognized for a long time since there's been immunohistochemical staining and so on. Um, but there's less remyelination in humans than there is in animal models of MS. Um, and we've heard some really nice work this morning from Dr. Uh, Miron, who was talking about oligodendrocyte precursor cells and so on. And it's fair to say that although um, as she said, the older people are in MS and the further on, therefore, they are in their um, MS phase, um, usually, uh, the less remyelination there seems to be. There's also very high individual differences. So some people seem to have more of a propensity to repair myelin than others. And she also pointed out that there's sometimes presence of oligodendrocyte precursor cells in lesions um, which you would think should be capable of remyelinating locally, and yet there's a lack of remyelination. And there's lots of unanswered questions that she really nicely covered about why that might be. And she talked about some of the signals that could be therapeutically mediated to try and allow those cells that are still present um, to, to do their job and remyelinate. So I think, as I said, you know, this initial immune insult in the white matter and the grey matter um, seems to put um, the neurons and axons under threat. And there are some compensatory mechanisms that we can make um, with MS. So first of all, people can remyelinate. There are natural homeostatic mechanisms from removing iron from tissues and um, they may be exhausted. There's a redistribution of ion channels across a demyelinated axon to allow conduction to be restored, but in a not very energy efficient way. And there's a turnover of mitochondria, so mitochondria can be damaged by some of the um, free radicals, the um, oxidative uh, damage that's happening because of um, the immune um, cell activation in the tissues. And yet, to a certain extent, um, the mitochondria can be renewed and turned over but again, that might um, be exhausted as, at a certain point. And then, of course, even in the presence of focal damage, there's this slightly different approach to overcoming that, which is plasticity. But as I've mentioned, you know, there's evidence that particularly at people who are at more advanced stages of their MS, that some of those mechanisms have become exhausted. So there's good data suggesting that glutathione, which would be detoxifying free radicals, is exhausted in the tissues of people with more advanced MS. And on the counter side, they may have an upregulation in enzymes that are actually exacerbating that free radical response. Um, and things like evidence of more accumulation of iron in the tissues 
um, and, and so on. So that you, know, that you often hear now this description of people um, having this virtual hypoxia because in the point at which there's um, the end of that cascade and that um, sort of neurodegeneration point, uh, it's almost as if um, there's a, a, a hypoxic um, environment in the tissues because there's this energy failure and, and mitochondria are so important to that. So that's the sort of summary, if you like, or revision of the, um, the disease biology, really trying to focus on the fact that, um, and I've borrowed this um, from Hans Lassmann's review, that, that although there is this complexity in disease biology, there's also definitely this change in the sort of pathology and disease mechanisms that have been observed over the course of someone's life with MS. And I think that's just a really important point to make when we think about our algorithms, which is what I'm going to move on to next. So... I think the first thing that we really have to acknowledge is that our algorithms are of immune drugs, immune modulating medications, and that really the evidence that we have in the trials of those is looking at best at suppressing these sorts of parts of the disease biology. And I think we have to acknowledge that you know, we don't really have evidence, at least, for whether those um, medications are um, addressing the other aspects of biology that I've pointed out. And of course, you know, although there's a huge drive to discover medications that are proven to have neuroprotective and reparative um, uh, ability, of, of course, there isn't really um, a licensed medication um, that, that sort of has that as a primary action. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the aspects of disease, disease algorithms, which is what I was asked to speak about. Um, and I think probably the most important thing to say is that for the reasons that I've hopefully explained, I think it just really supports this move that we've seen in the last 10 or more years towards an earlier intervention. So we try and expedite diagnosis now, don't we, when we're in the clinic? And I think we try and expedite starting treatment. You're going to hear from Klaus at a certain stage about his attack MS trial and so on. So there's this movement towards trying to get treatment started um, with immune therapy as early as possible. And I spotted Will Brown somewhere, but I didn't have a chance to say hello at lunchtime, but this is his work. Um, looking at, um, from the MS space cohort, looking at the effect on conversion to secondary progressive MS according to whether you had disease-modifying therapy um, with a platform therapy before year five of your disease duration or after year five, and then again whether you stepped up to a stronger treatment at a certain stage. And lots of other real-world evidence to suggest that this is early therapeutic window that's very important. Um, um, to try to make the most benefit. The next thing I wanted to talk about was just the way in which we um, uh, suppress the immune system or, or modulate the immune system. And of course, you'll be aware that some of the therapies we use have this title of immune reconstitution. And what we mean by that is that we're doing something to the immune system so that we almost reset it or we allow it, we deplete it in a way that we allow it to grow back with a more favorable immune phenotype. So it's not just a quantitative thing we're doing to the immune system, it's a qualitative thing. Um, and the drugs that we most associate that with that are ad, um, alimtuzumab and cladribine, but of course stem cell transplantation also um, in that field. Um, and David Baker um, is here and he's been, and his lab have been really key in sort of pointing out um, the nature of the immune response in people who've had these sorts of medications that then repopulate those cells. And as we can see here with the different T-cell phenotypes and the different B-cell phenotypes, that there's a, a depletion that's sustained in T-cells. And for a while, people thought, well, alimtuzumab's not really working on the B-cells. It must be driven mostly by its T-cell effect because the overall B-cell repopulation was quite brisk. But as he pointed out, actually the memory B-cells, which are probably um, by his group been shown to be very important in MS pathogenesis, actually do have a sustained depletion after alimtuzumab. Um, so, and as our group have shown um, that, you know, the people who are selected for alimtuzumab in the UK tend to be the people with very, very um, highly active MS, um, shown here in terms of these dots being relapses prior to alimtuzumab treatment here, shown by the vertical line. And as you can see, in many people, alimtuzumab does effectively switch off their MS or at least reduce the rate of relapses. And that's after, in many cases, just two treatments, although in some cases, people requiring or going on to have more. So this immune reconstituting therapy um, appears to have some benefits, particularly if it can be used early. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the alimtuzumab, where it was used in secondary progressive MS with a very different effect 
on those sorts of outcomes where that um, therapeutic window of opportunity seemed to have been missed. Um, but more recently, again, um, you know, David Baker's group and others have, have sort of highlighted the possibility that actually some of the anti-CD20s may be also having some immune reconstituting effects. So we've just heard from Dr. Ye that we think of them as maintenance treatments that we need to carry on, and someone asked the question about when do we ever stop. But actually, I think there's some really interesting work, and this is on rituximab, um, uh, but I think it just demonstrates nicely that anti-CD20s, um, when you look at overall... Um, B cell repopulation after uh, rituximab, it doesn't show the whole story because what you're mainly seeing is a return of immune, uh, sorry, immature um, B cells, but actually these memory B cells that seem to be, as I've said, most important in the MS pathogenesis are actually um, suppressed in a much more sustained way, um, suggesting that maybe there is some immune reconstituting effect, and I think there's more work to be done here, but Certainly, some of the cohorts that are now being described where um, ocrelizumab has been stopped or rituximab is being stopped um, and then people have been followed up um, suggests that the um, relapses and active MRIs that are shown here as the diamonds and the suns in this group of people where they were on rituximab, sorry, it should say not ocrelizumab, um, and they had a, a, a planned cessation of their therapy and then some follow-up. And it's actually striking that you can see that there are not any relapses or active MRIs in this period. And this was interim report, but certainly it was exceeded the six-month treatment interval that you would expect to start to worry about disease reactivation in people who've had an anti-CD20. So immune reconstituting, what we might call induction therapies, I think have um, immense um, uh, sort of interest when you think about the disease biology. And I think the other thing about them is that patients often like them because they almost think, well, it gets my treatment done. So when I showed that cohort of 100 people who'd had alimtuzumab in, in Wales and in, in, in some other centres, um, you know, many of them only had two treatments and then they didn't have anything else. Um, and that's seen in this um, work that's ongoing and it's part of a UK MS trials and consortiums, um, uh, trials and registered consortium. Uh, and we've pooled data um, on uh, about four and a half thousand patients and we've looked at their persistence on therapy. And actually, if you count persistence as never needing any other therapy, then um, people who have these um, in re immune reconstituting therapies um, you know, seem to almost get their treatment done and not need anything after, whereas others often stop, often switch, and, and the treatments are therefore more complicated. So if we think of induction therapy as being one option, what about escalation therapy? And as many of you know, this is an interest close to my heart because I'm very involved with the Deliver MS study, which is studying in a randomised perspective way the comparison of people who start an immune reconstitution sort of induction uh, monoclonal antibody type therapy versus people who start something of modest efficacy and are monitored to see whether they need to step up to um, a higher efficacy therapy. So I think the first thing to say, um, Klaus has disappeared, but Klaus often asks me at meetings, is the Deliver, Deliver MS trial going to be relevant? He really believes that we already know from real-world evidence that high efficacy treatment is the only way um, and that there is no need for escalation. And I strongly disagree with that. And part of the reason I do is because the first question we have to ask ourselves is, does everybody want high efficacy therapy. So I'll share with you some data from the Deliver MS study. And if you know the study, there's a randomized cohort, but there's also an observational cohort. And that's because we wanted to capture people who didn't feel comfortable being randomized. So these may be the people that have very rapidly evolving severe MS who would not be comfortable having um, a modest efficacy DMT. Or they might be people who just don't feel comfortable having a high efficacy DMT, but we still wanted to involve them in the study and capture exactly the same data in an observational way. And what's interesting is if you look at this far um, bar here, is that these are people that went into the observational study. They weren't randomized, so they chose their therapy along with their neurologist. And actually, you know, it's not overwhelming in the people that have early highly efficacious therapy, so that being high efficacy versus escalation. A significant proportion of people want escalation therapy. They want to start on a modestly effective drug and see what happens. Um, and I think there are various reasons for that. I just split it into the pandemic because we wondered whether this was all being driven by people being terrified of having monoclonal antibodies because of COVID. I think you can see that that's not the case. Um, but the question that's difficult to answer at the moment, and I think uh, it, why we need uh, trials like the Deliver MS study, is does everyone need high efficacy drugs? So I think there's lots of evidence that if you have a high efficacy drug, you're less likely to have a relapse or you're less likely to have a worsening of your disability. But does that mean that every single patient with MS needs a high efficacy drug first? I think we're very uncertain about that. And I think the reason partly 
is how do we know when to escalate and, and, and how to monitor and so on. And I'll share with you um, data um, from Catherine Harding and, and, um, and myself and colleagues in South Wales who published um, a couple of years back. But there are other MS based um, uh, cohorts that have looked at a similar thing. And what we were looking at is we were looking at the time to establish disability according to whether you had early highly intensive therapy or whether you had an escalation approach. And you can see that by the time we get to long um, times after therapy onset, the numbers are very small. But there did seem to be some favour for the people that had early intensive therapy. So that very much supports, and that's why um, people do sort of tend to imply that actually the question's already answered, we've got the real world data. But I think a couple of the things that I just wanted to pull out about these sorts of cohorts is that some of them are quite historic, ours included, and I think they're taking data from a time where the algorithms really don't reflect what we do in contemporary times. So for instance, the escalation rate in our cohort, I would say, was very low. Only 12% of people who set out on that approach actually escalated. It was almost always in response to relapse, and it was very slow. I'd hate to think now that patients that were destined to need escalation had to wait two and a half years for it to happen. So I think we need to be really careful about saying the question's already been answered. We've got the real world data, because actually the real world data is sometimes you know, not been um, uh, optimal. We, we use all of the data we have because we want to increase our power. So, and, and actually, that sort of therapeutic inertia that I've pointed out, and there's a, a sort of definition now for this, implies that someone is started on a modest efficacy drug, and they're monitored in a varied way um, in different centres. And sometimes there can be breakthrough disease activity, and people say, well, there's only a little bit, there's only one or two lesions, and you're quite happy on the drug, and I don't think we'll change anything. And this is this description of sort of inertia. So the goal is not met, but you don't step up. And I think it'll be really interesting to see in these trials what are people's approach to escalation? Um, one of the advantages of the trials is that we do monitor people quite proactively and the clinicians get the, response, um, the results of that MRI monitoring and so on, so they can act. But you know, what, what would I do and what would you do and so on about disease activity? What is our goal? Are we going for um, no evidence of disease activity? And of course, there are lots of different definitions even of that now, aren't there? NEDA 3, 4, and so on. So, so what is our goal? Well, if we just take NEDA 3 as an example, um, this is work from uh, the authors of the MIST study in um, autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, looking at NEDA rates um, in, in that and other trials of that. But actually, you know, it's quite staggering, isn't it, when you look at how many patients on our licensed therapies achieve NEDA. It's not a very realistic goal, you know, because a lot of people on even what we would consider to be highly efficacious therapies are having breakthrough disease activity. So I struggle with this a little bit because I think it's a, an ambitious target. I think it's a good one to go for. But you know, when you look at this, um, it strikes me that it's, um, it's not very achievable. And of course, the more aspects in EDA we have, the, the more that's the case. So I think some of the problems about saying, does everybody need high efficacy therapy is that we haven't really got this bit right yet. And I think we need to sort of have an agreement on algorithms and have more data to, to inform that. And of course, taking that even further, well, you know, if someone asked the question before of Dr. Ye, should we actually be de-escalating de or stopping? And when is that the case? Well, you know, the simplest way to think about it is that all of these trials of the immune therapies that we use for relapsing disease, are um, they go through phase three programs where annualized relapse rate is usually the primary outcome measure. So if we think of that as our primary outcome, well, we know that past a certain age, relapse rates naturally decline, and this is from um, sort of natural history cohorts. And, you know, something that um, Dr. Ye touched on as well and um, that I think is important um, to think about is that the risks that we look at in a phase three trial are different according to the age of our patients. And we saw that a little bit with opera versus oratorio, so the infection rates were higher in those people with primary progressive MS and higher mean age and so on. Um, so I think both age and possibly advanced disability seem to be a risk factor for some of the infective complications of um, treatment. Um, and then I think there is some evidence that malignancy risk, um, although I agree it's largely reassuring with these medications, that it might be a little bit um, higher in those people of more advanced age. So, you know, being mindful of those things, there are people who suggest that the um, algorithm that would be best suited to that relapse sort of um, trend in terms of natural history would actually be a de-escalating approach. Um, and likewise, I think this was a very clever study that did a huge uh, meta-analysis of the effect of our existing immune-mediated disease-modifying therapies 
on um, treatment effects. So this was um, not looking at relapse rate, this was looking at confirmed disability worsening. But some of the quite striking findings was that, um, you know, beyond the age of about 55, just looking at the effect um, in those trials on an EDSS worsening, um, that it was difficult to demonstrate any efficacy. So it, again, the um, amount of benefit might be influenced according to which disease, stage of the disease course we're at. Um, so I think that, you know, where, whereas some people would talk about stopping, I think other people might say, well, we probably do need to keep some level of immune modulation going throughout the course of MS and possibly add in other medications with a different, more reparative neuroprotective mechanism into that. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that the main benefit of the disease-modifying therapies we have is early in the disease. Um, so coming to stopping then, as you know, there have been some trials looking at this, and I just wanted to highlight what I think is quite a nice, because um, it has some practical sort of messages, um, a table um, that was from some of these authors, looking at if they had people who had an age of 55 or more who had had disease stability for at least eight years on disease-modifying therapies and had a quiet scan at the time, then their risk of disease reactivation after stopping was 10%. So I think there are some ways in which we can maybe try and um, identify people that might be more suitable for stopping current disease-modifying therapies. It's not perfect, 10%. You know, it's a significant minority. So I think the thing that I would, the approach I would take, so this is from the authors, so John Corboy, um, very involved in um, one of the um, stopping trials, said that they start to have the discussion with people in this category. But I think one of the important things is that if, if we're having these discussions, we also need to have a really clear discussion about how we're going to monitor people when they stop, because there is huge variation, and there will be some people that have been um, quiet in terms of their um, focal disease um, activity for some time, and um, against all odds, when you stop them, they suddenly reactivate. So I think stopping is a very difficult area practically, but it probably is something we should be thinking more about. But what about progressive MS? Because um, why are we talking about stopping when we're only just getting licensed treatments for people in the more advanced stages of disease? Well, yes, I mean, we're familiar with these um, curves from the Oratorio and Expand study of Ocluzumab and Saponimod. Um, in primary and secondary progressive cohorts. But of course, um, you know, this separation, it was great news because it brought us the first licensed therapies to use in these disease groups where their needs had been woefully undermet. But of course, you know, even in the people on the active drug, unfortunately, the curves are still moving upwards. These people are still progressing in terms of their disability. So it's likely that what we're doing is acting on some part of their disease biology, but as I've said, not um, addressing the more important part of their disease biology at that phase. So coming to the end of the talk then, what is the future? Um, well, I like this quote from Hans Lassmann's um, review here that's considering the complexity of the interactions that are going on um, by the time people get to this sort of advanced stage of disease. It seems quite unlikely that targeting a certain process, certain glial cell, um, we've heard about this morning and so on, is likely to be the solution. So is the solution going to be that we keep on a degree of what we think of as our traditional immune modulation that we use now, but we also add in other therapies that are addressing different parts of this sort of cascade of, um, uh, you know, reactive oxygen species and, and sort of astrocytic damage and oligodendrocyte death and so on. So trying to address some of those um, things directly. There's a really nice um, review of the mechanisms and, um, in progressive MS and therapeutic approaches to those, which I'd really encourage you to read. But it gives a nice breakdown of what are the qualities that we need for drugs to address this aspect of the disease. So they need to be able to enter the CNS because there might be that relatively intact blood-brain barrier. Um, they need to be able to neutralize um, lymphocytes to either antagonize microglia or at least to detoxify some of the free radicals, the oxygen um, uh, free radicals. And then um, to you know, enhance remyelination, enhance neuroprotection, and so on. And actually, although some of our existing licensed medications can do some of these things, um, unfortunately, we don't really have um, medications so far to address them. Interestingly, on what I think is one of my final slides, um, we've been really blessed to have some of these high-throughput screening models. Um, and uh, again, Dr. Miron talked this morning about how she and her lab has started to um, screen existing compounds successfully to identify compounds that can do certain things that you um, hypothesize should be helpful in advanced MS. And that's great because it's 
brought some compounds that show promise. And interestingly, um, because Jeremy Chatterway, I think, is speaking at the meeting tomorrow morning about the octopus trial, but of course he's the PI of the MS STAT2 trial, uh, which is yet to report. But interestingly, statins um, were one of the compounds that was cited in this um, uh, review here as satisfying all six of these criteria. So, you know, it's with interest that we follow up the MS STAT2 um, study to see whether uh, that has a, a meaningful effect. <laughs> on progressive MS. So I just wanted to thank you for your attention, just to summarise by saying that, of course, our knowledge on disease biology and the complexity of that is improving, and it's really important to keep in mind the way that that evolves over the course of the disease. Um, that, sadly, I mean, there's been huge advances in disease-modifying therapy, but sadly, when you take a wider perspective, we're really only tackling a very small part of the problem. The early treatment remains really key. I think when you think about algorithms, I agree with what Ruth Dobson said this morning, you know, starting any treatment early, I think, is much more important than which treatment it is. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's likely, we talk about de-escalating, we talk about stopping. In my mind, it's quite likely that a lot of people in MS are going to need some sort of long-term immunomodulation, but it's almost certain that in order to try and halt or even, let's hope, reverse established disability, we'll certainly need medications that... Um, approach things from a very different angle. So just wanted to say thanks again for listening.